My interest in Piero is related to, to, uh, to Vasari, as a matter of fact, to the uh, German edition of the Lives uh, of Vasari that I produced with my students over with a work of 11 years. Uh, and it took us, you know, just 11 years to translate and comment a new commentary uh, with a group of uh, five, six uh, excellent stu German students, uh, the uh, translation of the second edition of Vasari's Lives. We are going to do it also the first edition now, and I know that there is only one international uh, edition that is not in Italian, and indeed it is a Brazilian yeah. edition of 1550. Uh, strangely enough, uh, the English and the Americans and all uh, French and other people have not translated Vasari's 1550 into their own language, so we are going to do that in German. And of course, the life of Piero di Cosimo plays a major role in the architecture the, the, the whole architecture of the lives, uh, uh, as we know. In, in reality, if we can work on Pierre de Cosimo, you know, we, uh, we owe it to Vasari's lives. I mean, he was the first one to put together uh, almost 35% uh, of the uh, works of art we know today, and they are the most important ones, and he identified them for us today. So, and what I'm fascinated with, with my boundless admiration for Vasari remain as an historian and as a writer. So he's amazing, he's amazingly entertaining, but also at the same time his historical knowledge, his historical model is uh, uh, extremely sophisticated and new. It's really modern uh, in a certain sense. So my boundless admiration is for the writer and the historian, as far as the life of Pierre de Cosimo, of course I share the, the, the meinung, the opinion of, of my colleagues. Vasari's lives are well, well known, they are built as a, as a kind of progress. Vasari uh, divided the, the, the history of Italian art from Cimabue to his own days uh, in, three, uh, in three different parts. And uh, there is a linear progression, so to speak, to the, very, for the apex. And in the first edition of the Lives, uh, this peak uh, is represented by Michelangelo. In the second edition of the Lives, it is the Florentine Academy, which had been founded in 1563 by Vasari himself and his friends uh, as a kind of political instrument for the Grand Duke Cosimo I. So, uh, in this sense, it is teleologically constructed, it is always a kind of progress, you know? it is a kind of linear uh, notion of history with no contradictions, uh, no tensions, uh, as, we, as the reality is, and as we like it very much to do nowadays. So uh, Piero is not an obstacle, Piero is an instrument. I mean, he uh, the, 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 is he's, he's placed in a strategic, strategic uh, position in, in the entire economy of the lives, physically speaking as well as intellectually. It is at the opening of the third part of the lives, uh, the, the so-called uh, Maniera Moderna, uh, and first of all, you have the life of Leonardo da Vinci, then the life of Giorgione, and then the life of An Antonio da Correggio, Antonio Allegri da Correggio. Uh, as you can uh, imagine, since Leonardo did most of his uh, career, the most important works were done in Lombardy, in Milan, and not in Florence, they realized that they had a problem for this kind of, uh, of Florentine disegno ideology because the Maniera Moderna in reality uh, was created in the north of Italy, between the dry, uh, dry, triangle between Milan, Venice and Parma, uh, and not in Florence. So they need somebody, they need a hero uh, that is going to represent the Florentine Maniera Moderna, and they choose Piero di Cosimo. Therefore, I mean, he's, he, he's not an obstacle to it, but he's part of it, uh, even if they have to adjust his biography. Therefore, they invent new things uh, and anecdotes uh, that are not appropriate and they're not historically founded. And that uh, they represent that kind of uh, portrait of the artist uh, which people, modern historians, don't like. But at the same time, it is a kind of uh, stroke of genius uh, from the part of the writers of the 16th century. Of course, Vasari and these collaborators, because he was not alone, we know that he was not alone, of course, uh, uh, change uh, in the second edition uh, a great deal of what they have written in the first edition. 
the, the life that is mostly uh, redone uh, and uh, reorganizes the life of Giorgione, which is completely different. They have, to, they have made so many mistakes in the first edition that they had to change it completely. Uh, but even, even the life of Leonardo has changed considerably. For example, uh, he mentions for the first time one of his masterpieces, The Adoration of the Magi, which is uh, mentioned in the 1568 edition, but not in the 1550 edition, for example. And also the times have changed. In 1550, he could uh, represent Leonardo as a sort of uh, heretic, almost a magician, uh, in any case, uh, uh, somebody who died uh, 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 criticizing almost uh, almost the Catholic Church. I mean, he converts himself at the very end of this narrative, but in any case, he's, a, he's represented as a kind of outsider. This sentence is deleted in the second edition of the life because it is after the Council of Trent, after 1563, you cannot maintain that Leonardo is a kind of maverick, a religious maverick. So you have these adjustments, but the life is basically uh, more or less uh, the same, which very important new material. In the case of Fear of the Cosmo, it's completely, the, the, the entire life is completely re redone and reorganized. The, the, the proemio is cut, uh, the end uh, with the epitaph is also cut, uh, and uh, they are adding new, new, new material to these, uh, to these uh, first lives of 1550, uh, and, and I think it is, in, in a sense, it's a structural change which is much more important than what has been done with the lives of Leonardo, for example. I don't know if we can have a, have a look at this, but at the same time, this is the beginning of the 1550 edition, and this is the 1568 edition. Uh, as you can see, this is the 1568. This is 1550, and this is 1568. 1568 edition is, is much shorter uh, than this. So all the anecdotal and, uh, um, let's say, uh, almost uh, um, insulting <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> portrait uh, of the artist uh, uh, written by Vasari in the first edition has to disappear because he has become, so to speak, the, rep the representative, the official representative of the Maniera Moderna in Florence. So he cannot be a kind of rascals or a criminal. <laughs> so they've changed completely and I'm pretty pretty certain that the person who rewrote uh, this first part, which is much shorter and much more interesting, uh, was probably Vincenzo Borghini and not Vasari himself. Uh, and if I can read it, uh, Mentre che Giorgione e il Correggio con grande loro loda e gloria onoravano le parti di Lombardia, non mancava la Toscana ancora di belli ingegni fra i quali non fu dei minimi Piero, figliolo di Lorenzo, Orafo e allievo di Cosimo Rosselli. So, uh, interestingly enough, there is no, uh, no mention of Leonardo, because Leonardo, they, they perfectly understand that you know, Leonardo is a North Italian phenomenon, basically. And so they need somebody who represents the, the disegno theory, the disegno dogma and ideology in Florence, and uh, you know, the only, almost one of the few artists who can be selected for this part is Pierre di Cosimo. So they changed completely this, 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 this beginning, and I think it's one of the most uh, uh, intellectually uh, uh, exciting uh, passages of the lives that they really understand that something new has been happening on a stylistic view uh, uh, as far as painting is concerned with this triad of people, you know, uh, Leonardo, Giorgione and Correggio. So there is La Maniera Moderna, the new kind of soft modern manner uh, which is promoted by these artists and, you know, just somehow this Cosimo the Piero di Cosimo, even if stylistically uh, not, doesn't fit completely in this, in this because he's much more interested in color, for example, in Flemish art, is placed at this, at this very uh, place of, 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 of the Vita uh, to represent the new modern manner. Since uh, uh, the work of uh, Chris and Kurz uh, on the legend and the myth uh, of the artist, uh, uh, we all know uh, how, uh, how the, the role played by Topoe in the, in, the, in the narrative of lives of artists in general and, uh, and of Vasari's lives in particular. 
uh, th that is obvious. So, you know, there are inventions, there are fictions. I mean, it is what is nice about that. You know, but but uh, at the same time, there are two aspects. On the one hand, uh, uh, of course, uh, each topos is like a myth. Uh, at the base of a topos, I mean, why are you employing these topos? I mean, you have a, a choice. You can use many topoi, and from you know a hundred topoi, you can choose that topos uh, just to to deal with a real situation, for example. So it's obvious that there are topoi, but at the same time, you are choosing as a narrator the topoi that ser serve a certain kind of narrative, and this narrative can be a reflection of what historically truly happened. So it, there is no contradiction there, I think. And uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 so there is a, a, a kind of recognition that even the writing of history is fiction, um, uh, since at least the post postmodern postmodern uh, postmodern uh, 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 literary uh, um, uh, historians uh, have demonstrated. You know? So uh, I think that it's uh, relatively I wouldn't say naive, but uh, uh, perhaps not so important to, to try to. To, to, to go to the truth of, of things. I mean, what is important is how Vasari constructed his narrative uh, and not what happened, at least from my own point of view, I'm speaking of Vasari, I'm not speaking of Pierre de Cosimo. Then as an historian, of course, you have the duty just to, to, to do your archival research and to try to find uh, the truth. But at the same time, I think uh, that uh, uh, one of the most important aspects uh, of, of this narrative uh, in Vasari is that uh, uh, it, it is a form of literary truth. Vasari uh, speaks of uh, parletico, which is a kind of a paralysis of the hand, of a trembling, you know, that is describing a kind of uh, uh, physical condition that doesn't allow him to go on with painting. For, and now the documents are published by Louis Waldman, I think in the Art Bulletin or in any, in any case, uh, have confirmed that over the last few years of his life he could not you know, just be a painter, just, he was just thinking of uh, being helped by other people. And this is information probably in the life of, of uh, 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 Pierre de Cosimo, uh, probably one of the most important informants uh, for uh, Vasari was uh, Francesco da Sangallo, uh, who was a member of the Academy, by the way. So, so why to doubt all this information that probably came to Vasari orally, but the sources were very good. Andrea del Sarto, Andrea de Cosimo Feltrini, uh, Francesco da Sangallo, uh, so I think that sometimes it's relatively uh, uh, disappointing when the modern art historians are trying to prove that Vasari was wrong. Uh, uh, first of all, he did have to, he and his collaborators had to start from scratch. There was nothing written on Pierre de Cosimo. So if we can write on Pierre de Cosimo, it's because of Vasari. So I think we should recognize and giving him his due, in any case, before criticizing him that somebody had in 1550, 1568 a different concept of history as we have in 2010 or 2016, I think it is obvious, you know, so that nobody is going to complain about that. Uh, and I think that probably the, 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 this portrait of a melancholic uh, artist at the very end of his life uh, uh, could be could be could be true. I mean, in a sense, in the sense that, but it's not very important. It's certainly literary uh, well done, and this is what is most important. I think it is a relatively, uh, um, uh, uh, not absurd, but uh, uh, um, uh, strange uh, to, to, to try to prove that Vasari was wrong. I mean, what, when he's done, you know, we know about 60 paintings by Pierre de Cosimo, 25 are already in Vasari's lives, and they are correct. They are the most important ones. What do you want more? I mean, on the one hand, there is a kind of historical tradition, uh, you know, just to go into archives, trying to find uh, uh, the truth. But there is also what we, what is supposed to be the historical truth. But there is also a kind of naivete. Of course, the, in the archives you find already a kind of history that has been accumulated there 
which is not, uh, is not, is not real. It's also a kind of narrative in a sense. Mm -hmm. So it looks more scientific uh, uh, to, to go and to investigate uh, uh, in an archive uh, 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 when an artist was born, uh, when he produced a certain painting, who were his patrons. And interestingly enough, this kind of method was introduced firstly by Borghini himself, so which is a kind of nemesis. Uh, no, which is which is opposite is what we do and what we are trying to do. So it is very important. We should not be cynical. Uh, at the same time, as I mentioned before, I think that we should be aware of the fact uh, that even when we create recreate a context, uh, uh, it's inevitably uh, the author. Uh, comes into play. I mean, you are going to write a different story uh, as a, from from my. I mean, there will be no 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 consensus on this kind. I mean, you can reach a, a certain uh, surface of the truth, but then if you want to go deeper, as our natural philosopher uh, Pierre de Cosimo should have done or did, according to Vasari, uh, I think that probably there is in narrative. Uh, 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 also a, 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 a truth, I mean truth in inverted mm -hmm. commas. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful to divide between what is, you know, what is uh, do documented and what is uh, the product uh, of a pure narrative. Uh, uh, I think that the second art of doing history is no less important. And I think it will become even more important in our millennium, so to speak, just to, to write well, to try to communicate. Uh, I mean, it's to, re to reproduce reality as it was, it's impossible. It's a, but I don't want to sound cynical. I'm not yeah. saying that it is uh, useless. On the contrary, of course, it is one of our duty. But at the same time, we have to be aware that just uh, trying to recreate the past as it was is impossible. In order to, to understand Vasari, to, uh, Vasari's life of Pierre di Cosimo, you have to put it into a context of the entire structure of the lives. So you have to uh, look at uh, the life of Paolo Cello, for example, and at the life of Pontormo, because they are, they are the odd people, so to speak, the three odd people in, in Vasari's uh, narrative again. So that's, we, one should look at this kind of triptych as well when dealing with the life of Piero di Cosimo. So uh, nothing is uh, 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 not planned, everything is planned in Vasari's yeah. life. That is, that is the most, above all in the second edition I must say, because they had the time to put together, so to speak, through Borghini's intervention. Borghini was already present in the first edition of the lives of course, but not so, so decisively as in the second edition of the lives when, of course, you have to deal with the founding of the Academy of the Artists in 1563. And that's the change. And, of course, with the end of the Council of Trent as well in 1563. So I think it's a very important, important dates and they explain a lot about, you know, the changes which happened uh, in, to lives in the last part uh, of this uh, in, in the second edition of, of the lives. Mm -hmm.